hear the word of the Lord with me this morning as there is a man who has lived his life. He has been called up and he's lived his life for the purposes of God. And now he's finishing his race and he's got calling out, but he's calling up a, another young man. Here's what the Bible says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. For almost a year, I've been with other people in other places as well as with you, thinking about what God's doing. And look at this question that I've been, I've been asking people, this question that comes on the screen for you this morning. What is, what is to be our purpose in the times that we live? But let me, let me re rethink about it for a moment and, and simply ask it this way. Why are you alive in 224? I mean, why were you not alive in, in 1924? The psalmist said it this way. Look on the screen, Psalm 39 and 4. Lord, make me to know my end. I'm here today to tell you that this, that, that God has called you to a purpose. And he's, he's going to do this in this series. If he hasn't already, he's going to nudge you a little bit. He's going to nudge you for some of you to accept, accept Him as, his Lord, as Lord and Savior. For others of you, He's going to nudge you to, to awaken to the fact is that all of your life, God has put you for this moment in your time. Others of you, He's going to just remind you, you're already awake, but you're kind of getting tired because all these pressures coming to you, there's an attack. And that attack is kind of pushing you down, and God's going to nudge you a little bit, and He's going to awaken you to the reality of what He has for your life. Now, some of you say, like, where in the world is this going to happen? It's going to happen in the pages of 2 Timothy. You say, I I'm just really not, not with you right now in this moment. Well, I want you to hear this. Look at on the screen. This is a letter for our time, for our task, and for our transformation. You say, I I'm still not with you. I thought this was a pastoral letter from a pastor to another pastor. Well, it is. But listen to all of us need a pastor, and all of us pastor somebody. All of us are called, whether it's in business, that, that is your mission field. Whether it's, it's some job you're working for someone else, it's your mission. Whether you're in retirement, wherever you are, whatever your circumstance, God is nudging you just a little bit. And he's saying, I want you to serve me because in 2024, it's your turn now. You, you say, I'm not following you. Well, look with me in chapter, chapter 1, verse number 8. I'm going to kind of give you just a little bit of an overview for a moment. Here's what, what Paul writes. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. This older man is in prison. Look in chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my child, he considers Timothy his child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me, say heard from me, heard from me in the presence of many witnesses in trust of faithful men. How many of you have been a Christian longer than five years? Anyone in the room? Anybody longer than five years in the room? So if you've been in this church for five years, you have heard systematically, listen, in the last five years, 13 different books of the Bible we've walked through. Look with me in chap chapter number two, verse 15. Here's what the Bible says. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who needs not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. This older man is not a man who's frustrated. He's not, he's not a man who in the midst of his prison is kind of down and out and, and he's belittling other people. This is a man who's focused at the end of his journey. He's at the end of his journey and he's focused on the right thing. Look with me if you would please now in chapter number 2 and verse number 24. He says this, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everybody, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness, so that God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Here's a guy who's so focused in his life and he says, Timothy, it's your turn because you're the servant of the Lord. How many of you consider yourself as a servant of the Lord. If you're a servant of the Lord, that God has trained you, He's saying to you, no matter your time that you have left on the earth, it's your turn now for a special purpose. Look with me, chapter 4 and verse number 2. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. He says, Timothy, it's your time, and this is your particular task. And listen to me, we all have different tasks, do we not? 
For me in my life, it's very simple until I die that I'm to pastor and shepherd the people of God. I am also this to prepare the next generation by reaching them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm to shepherd pastors locally, nationally, and globally. That's my particular call of God. And you have your own in your life, your particular call of God. And so let me ask you this. What are you doing in 2024 with what you've been gifted with? You say, Pastor, I, I, I'm still not with you. Listen to me. In every generation, God has had a call upon people's lives. Sometimes he nudges easily, sometimes hard. But in all of them, Brother Joe, he says, I want you for this time. It's your turn. But I've got to tell you, there's, there's going to be a group of people that will be the last people he calls up. There's going to be a people that will be the last ones. There's going to be a people that will come, and they'll be the ones that God will say to them, you're the generation that's going to usher in the kingdom of God. And I believe, I'm telling you today, that many pastors around the world are sensing the same thing, that this could be it. And you're saying, but I don't feel it. I just don't agree with you. My life's been going on just like it always has been. I don't know why you're all so excited about it. it's my turn because I, I, I just don't feel anything. Well, listen to the words of David Platt. He said this recently. God does not reveal the intimate things of his heart to those who are just casually coming and going. So if you today find yourself that, that you're just really doing life and you don't have a burden for anything, I want to say this to you today. God's going to nudge you and say this to what our mentor, Sherry's my, our mentor at Liberty University would say this. I, I, I just wish your girls could have met him. They're there at the university now. But he would say this. He said, the call of God is not for wimps, it's for warriors. So how many servants of the Lord do I have who are warriors in this room? And watching online, I think many of you are truly are. And what we want to do over the next few weeks together is to realize it's our turn. Now think of it this way. Look in chapter number 4 and verse 9. He says this, do your best to come to me soon. And then look down in verse number 21. He says, do your best to come before winter. You see, Paul is about to die. And he knows this, that Timothy is in Ephesus. He's, he is three, at least three months it will take him by boat to come to make his way and then by land to get there. And he says, Timothy, if you wait till winter time, then you won't be able to travel by boat to get here and I will die before you make it. Think about this with me today. I'm going to insert it right here. God has called every generation to serve him, but for somehow or another, the generation before this generation, it skipped them. In most churches, friend, you have people who are 50, 60, and 70. You miss a generation, am I right? You miss people there between, and then you get down in the teenagers, and you get down, in, and down below them in the preschool, and there's some there. There was a season that was us. But I want you to know there's an awakening of God that has come, that if you would have been in our group on, on, on Sunday night, I had 38 people between the ages of 18 and 29, 38 people that were in a room with me on Sunday night. I'm seeing in our church now, there's an awakening. And in the second service, this, this room, last Sunday morning, this room in the second service had very few seats anywhere on the floor open because there is a generation that's raising up. And I wanted to come to you. I Many of you are more of that 40, 50 years of age, maybe a few years older than that, a few younger than that. I want to say this to you. It is your turn now. But I've got to ask you this question. How much time do you have left? How much time do you have left, and what are you going to do with your time left? Because if this is the last generation, if this is the generation that's going to usher the come, Lord, or if it's not, what's going to be in 20, 30 years from now if we don't step up in this time and take, it, take the bull by the horn spiritually and say, God, we're going to stand for you, and I believe that we are. What I want to do today as we, we, as we spend our time together, I just, I just want to spend this, I want to talk about as we look back and ask three questions and then I'll close. The first question that I would ask you is this, what was happening in their time? What was happening in their time and what's happening in our time? In their time, the Bible says, if you go back to chapter 1 with me now, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul was an apostle. You see, Paul had made a decision earlier in his life. He had decided that he would listen to God on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. He bought in, brother. He bought into who Jesus was, and he would spend the rest of his life serving the Lord. What time was it when 2 Timothy was written? It was the time the church was 50 years old. 
All of that first generation were dying now. Nero had come to the throne in Rome. He was a madman, and he would, he, at that time, he was not persecuting very much, but the Jews got tired of, of, of others saying that Christians were a sect of Judaism, so they pushed them aside, and they began now systematically persecuting the Christians, and there would be a moment in Rome where that Nero would kill Christians, and he would burn them at the stake. They would light the fires at night. And this was the day Peter would shortly be put in prison. The other apostles, except Paul, had all died except the apostle John and Peter. And they would follow suit. But during those years, I want you to know it was an amazing journey for Paul. Look on the screens that comes up for you. Paul spent over 25% of his ministry in prison. Now that's a fourth any way you want to cut it. So a fourth of his ministry was in prison, but he was not a guy. That was discouraged or defeated. So, so what I want you to think about their time, I want you to look at your time. Because what happens is this, when God calls a people to be, when he nudges us and says, I want more out of you, we begin to make excuses. Am I telling the truth? I'm going to let you in on something today. I am praying passionately to God that he would raise up three families from our church who would say to us, I will answer the call and go with you and move to Atlanta and plant a church there. You're like, whoa, you did not just say that. We are praying as a team now that three families from this church would say, I'll go and move there and get a job in that area, or I'll commute every week and I'll be a part. Why? Because we just believe that God has said, make a difference in Atlanta, because if you don't, it's going to go the way of the world even worse than it is. You're like, but, but I've got my current job. Well, let's just follow Paul for a moment. Put, put what you're facing, you're like, I would, but I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And you say it again, I can't. But think about Paul. Paul would end up in Acts chapter 21. He would come back to Jerusalem. Remember that, brother? He'd come back to Jerusalem, and within a few hours, he would end up in prison. He would spend the next two years of his life, they would take him to Caesarea Philippi. They would not even make a charge against him. For two years. He would stay there, no official charge, and then after two years, they would now send down a delegation, the Jews would, and they would try to make a charge. They had no charge, and Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. He said, another six months, he goes on to Rome and stays two more years, four years in prison without an official charge against him. But Paul didn't waste his time. You know what he did in those, those years? He wrote Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. In Philippians, he said in chapter 1, verses 12 through 19, he said, because of my chains, the whole palace guard has come to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me in your Bible, if you would, for a moment. I want to give an example of what Paul would say about himself later on. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. Are you with me yet, or is it just me? Here, listen to what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. Here's what he said. Five times... I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less than one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, and danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false, false, false witnesses, and hardship and toil, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food. I was in cold and exposure. And apart from other things... There was the daily pressures on me of my anxiety for all the churches. So let me ask you this. Is your circumstance worse than his? He ended up in a maritime prison there in Rome. I did the research. A recent article in Christianity Today went back and did the historical narrative of the time and listened to what the article said. Roman imprisonment was always preceded by being stripped down naked. And then you'd be flogged. It was a humiliating, painful, and bloody ordeal. Then the bleeding wounds that you would have, they would, they would not be treated. They'd remain untreated. Your clothes would be put back on you. You'd be set there in the place where you're in chains. And there you were with your bloodstained clothing, and nobody replaced them. And if it happened to be in the cold of winter, which it was going to be in Paul's final imprisonment, many would die. Think about Paul. When we read 2 Timothy, he will simply say to them, bring me the cloak. I just, I'm cold. I'm, I'm freezing. You are responsible for your own food in the Roman prison. No one provided for you. Not only are you responsible for your food, you're responsible to take care of yourself in every way. And Paul will say at the end of chapter 4, he will say these words, no one's with me except Dr. Luke, but the Lord stood with me. 
So let me ask you this now. In his time, what would you have done? Do you know the stories are as this, that over half of the prisoners that would be in the Roman prison would commit suicide because they couldn't take it anymore. Now, I'm not discounting what you're facing. I, I, I see it every day in the hearts and lives of people, not only in our church, but outside our church, of people who are hurting, people who are broken, people whose lives are miserable. I mean, people that are so busy that they can't enjoy one moment because of the pressure of being pushed to something else. People who are looking for, for answers. This was Paul, and Paul said, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, I'm writing to you. Who was Timothy? Well, if we have just a moment to think about Timothy's time, if we had time, we would go to Acts 14, where there was a prayer meeting, and Paul came to Lystra, and, 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 and Timothy's parents, one was a Gentile, the dad, and his mom was a Jew, and apparently like this, the dad let him be trained in Judaism. He would not let him be circumcised. But he did let him follow that. And so his mother, Jew, his grandmother, a Jew, they told him about the Lord. And Paul came to his city, and Paul was stoned to death. And Paul got up and walked away in a miracle, and it impacted Timothy, and he got saved. Paul came back to the city two years later in Acts 16. And there Timothy was, and he'd so grown in his faith that they said to Paul, you should take this guy on a missionary journey with you. Take him to Malawi with you. Take him on a short-term mission trip. And so Paul took Timothy... And he became his son in the faith. Wherever Paul would go, Timothy was. Philippians 2, 20-24, he said this about him. I have no one who has a mind like it. My heart is his heart. And so Timothy began to be his protege, mentor, mentoree. And, and they walked together and he would send him on mission trips. He would go into troubled churches. Then there would come that day when Paul would say, Timothy, no more with me. You have your own church. He would send him to Ephesus. He would come to Ephesus, and if you do the research of Ephesus, man, it was not an easy place to live. It was a difficult place. Imagine not only that, Paul had planted the church. So you're following this great hero of faith. And by the way, John the apostle had been there for a while, and he would be put in prison. And so John had been there. Two apostles before you, and now you come to town. Anybody have it any more difficult than he? Look at your life now. He comes to Ephesus. There's the, the goddess of Diana who was instructing people to have sex on every corner. There he was. He gets in the church. And then after he's being there a while, First Timothy says that this false sect rises up. And so now he's got trouble in the church. I hear he's pastoring. He'd been with Paul. He had it, had it so wonderful with Paul. Traveled, saw the miracles of God, served him. And now he's in his own church preaching the Word of God, being faithful to the Word of God. And they're trying to run him off. Wow. That was their day. And Paul sends him this letter under the anointing of God. And he says, Timothy, are you ready to step up to the next assignment? Now, here's the big deal. Here's the big deal. Now, please stay with me in this. I hope I'm communicating you the word of God. You see, many of us like, I'm failing where I am. How could I be nudged to do more? Anybody feel that way? I mean, I'm barely making it right here and where I am now. Listen to me. What God was doing in Timothy, and we'll see that about six weeks from now, he was not saying to him, just add more to what you're doing. He's saying, rethink and redo your life. I believe this happens to all of us along the journey. We start out so strong for God in our day because here who we are, and then things happen in our lives. The next thing you know, we end up in a rut, and we've been in that rut for so long that God comes along and nudges us, not because that He doesn't love us, but because He does, He says, you were created for more. I believe I'm talking to someone right now that God's been dealing with your heart. You've not told anybody but you just don't know how to handle it. Can I tell you today, just trust God. I'll say in the second service how that that these these people in our world today, who they're they're tired of going to churches that are compromising. They've tried the things of the world. They found out that homosexuality is a lie. They have found out all the things of the world are a lie, and they're searching right now, and it's our turn. And if we will reach out to them, we will see in the second service, there'll be people from many different denominations who have come to our church now because they realize that we have the real deal, Jesus Christ, and we're going to be faithful to the Word of God until the end. It's our turn now. And God's called you. So here's the question as it comes up. What, What time do you have left? Do you want to finish out? 
the way you're going now. If you do, praise the Lord. Some of you are right where you need to be and just keep the journey, keep the journey of what you're doing because it's going to pay off. But for some others in this room that maybe God is saying, it's now for you in your time to re rethink and redo. The second question that we have is this, is this, what was God's task for their time and our time? What was the task? If you look in chapter 2 again, we read it already, but going back there one more time, chapter 2, verse 1, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit them to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What in the world was Timothy being called to? Look on the screen as it comes up. Paul was charging Timothy, notice this, to persevere in the ministry of the gospel and to fulfill the apostles' immense gospel sandals. It's your turn now. Listen to me. It's to, to me. Uh, I mean, think about it now. I mean, the, the older ones and uh, the great preachers are going, going away. Charles Stanley died this year, didn't he? I mean, people in churches everywhere, I, I, we, listen to me, churches everywhere are facing this reality that people's gospel sandals are falling. So the, think about this today. Will you wait until they're gone to do something? Why? Not that we're replacing people, but people are stepping up and people who are in their business are still serving. But it's your turn. It's your business. It's your turn at your job and in your home it, as a child of a parent. It's your turn. God has called you for this. So I want to ask you this question. Do you have a willing heart? Do you have a willing heart to accept the task God has given you? You say, what do you mean? There are over 8 billion people again on the world. We've now turned back up after COVID. In America today, there are 342 million people alive in America. Out of those in our county, the life census, there are over 26,000 of us Americans living in Butts County. So here's the question today. Will you step up for them? Will you step up for the one who at the coffee shop's coming and dragging three kids and their, their hair's not made up right? They barely got their clothes on. They're coming in there and they don't have enough money, but because the world says a cup of coffee will make a difference, they're in there getting that coffee. It will not make a bit of difference other than it'll hype them up for a few minutes. But there you sit. There you sit in that moment. What will you do? Will you buy them a cup of coffee? Will you buy them their lunch? Listen to me, a teenager, we were in a place on Friday with my dad, and a teenager in our church, they, Sherry came to the table and said, this teenage, a teenager in our church bought all of our meals. I was like, what? A teenager in our church. Because she saw the value in us and said, I want to bless you. Will you step up? Will you step up in time and talent and treasure that God can use you in your life? See, Timothy had to overcome some struggles, and we'll talk about them next week. He had to overcome some things. I want to say this to you. Everything that you're facing is God's nudging, and it's really your opportunity. In Exodus chapter number 13 and verse 30, when they came back from the, the 12 spies and, and they were giving the bad report, Caleb spoke up. He said, we are well able because God's gifted us. Some of you are so gifted and you've forgotten about your giftedness. You say, I, I sit with children. I, I travel. I, when I travel, I always share with children. One of the things, great things I get to do is sit with kids and share the gospel. I do it here with our kids here, but I'm not the best at it. I mean, I panic. Anybody else? I'm sitting there with a 50 to 100 kids and they got their finger in their nose and, and they've got about three minute attention span. And I'm like, oh God, for the sake of their soul. God, help me in this moment, because I'm not the most gifted one. But then there's Ben sitting back there now. Ben, you have the anointing of God upon your life for children. And when Ben and his wife share with the children, they're just they're just like this. They're right up here with them. And thank God, Ben, that you have stepped up to the table and said, it's my turn now. Some of you are gifted in a thousand different ways. Some of you are gifted in business and you should be at your workplace having a one hour a week where that you are just so gifted in God that you sit them down and you share leadership principles with them. I don't know what your gifting is, but I know this, that God has called you for this time and this place and you have been gifted if you'll just say, God, show me what my gifts are. I remember as a little boy growing up in eastern Kentucky and my dad a coal miner and everybody else around me going into the coal mining business or a few guys were, uh, th thought they were good enough to play sports. But when you're five foot three, as they were, many of my friends, they were not going to play sports. 
I want to tell you, there was no one who believed in me when I was born except my mom and God. And God had a plan for my life, and God began shared with me early on in my life, it's your turn now, and I will never be able to say thank you enough to God. And then a pastor that came to pastor our church who looked at me and said, Keith, think bigger than who you are now, for you have a big God. And friend, I'll speak to you from all my heart today and say that you were destined to be the chief in this city. You are destined to be where you are. And listen to me, some of you are ready to get up and run from it because it's hard. Here's what I've discovered recently is this. God does not work with people who want to be blessed with their feet up on the couch. God works with people who are in the trenches. You're in the trenches. So why don't you just step up in this time? It is your task to take what God has given you. Friend, you say, well, but I haven't been to seminary. Friend, this is the seminary right here. Am I right? This is it right here, the Word of God. And God wants to use you for such a time as this. And I've just got a few moments left with you. So here's the last, the last question. What transformation needed to take place in their time and in our time? Remember chapter 1 and verse number 2 when Paul said to Timothy, my beloved child. Timothy, here's what his transformation needed to grace. How many of you need grace this morning? God, it's hard right now where I am in my life. God, it's tough. God, I need for by grace you're saved. But not only do you need grace, you need mercy. Many of us are like Peter. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can get ahead of God. Anyone else? Sometimes I can get in that place with my life or that I need as Peter was when he stepped out of the boat. God, I've got faith in, in you. And then what happened in Matthew 14 when he looked away, began to sink, and he said these words, Lord, save me. One author put it this way about life, and he said this, that most of us ask God to bless us. And then when he sends us the storm, we tap out at the first storm. Don't tap out, church. Don't tap out when it gets difficult. You say, what? I'm sensing that coming this year. It's going to come as we are debt-free as a church, as we are spiritually blessed by God. The numbers are growing. The devil hates everything that we're doing. He hates everything that you're doing in your life. So he's going to come at you. Don't tap out this year. Amen. Say, God, give me grace. Give me mercy. But then watch this. Peace. Timothy needed peace. Now, in the church at Ephesus, they would have to come to peace. Because if he was going to accept this new assignment, he would need their blessing. God never tells you to leave somewhere with unfinished business. He doesn't tell you to leave somewhere with unfinished business. What he tells you to do is take care of the business and finish your assignment. And when you finish your assignment, I have a new assignment for you. He needed peace. I'm so thankful after almost 32 years of marriage that when I go home at night, I have peace in my home. Some of you need peace in your home. I'm so thankful that when I pray to God, he's not left me because I have peace in my heart. So some of you need peace in your heart. Others of you, it's at your job site that there's just no peace there. Can I encourage you to go there and to give grace? Can I encourage you there to be a God of mercy and to have such peace that you can see beyond what they can see because you're walking with Jesus Christ? That's what we are called by God to do. God says, I'll give you grace, mercy, and peace. You say, well, Keith, how can this be in my life? Number one, you got to do this. You must receive grace. You must receive grace in your life. You say, Keith, how do I receive grace in my life? It's simply this, by the will of God. He wants you to have it. Friend, listen to me. You're, why are you going through this pain and, and doubt and arguments? Because God wants you. You, sir, you, ma'am. You watching online. He wants you to have the grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. And it begins with a prayer. And then the second step is that of surrendering to the purpose. He wants you to have grace, but He also wants you to do this. He wants you to learn to rejoice in His mercy despite the hard times. God wants you not to tap out. He wants you to have mercy. He wants you in this moment to receive it. And so today I'm doing this. I don't know what I'll face today. I know what I faced yesterday, and I don't know what I'll face tomorrow. But I know that He is a God of mercy. And God says, Keith, come before winter. Come before you wait too long. Lastly and finally, we must be courageous. Because this book says this to you. God whispers from heaven and He's screaming to some of us in the midst of the mess, it's your 
turn now. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions. And check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.